Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is a very special opportunity tonight. Uh, we're continuing the TUJ Philosophy Lecture ser Series. This is the fourth installment. And I have the great pleasure uh, to have here tonight with us uh, Mr. Thomas Kirshner. Also, his uh, uh, Buddhist name is Yuho, right? Thomas Yuho Kirshner. Um, and I will let this honor of if introducing Mr. Kirshner uh, to our very own Professor Lee Roser. Nice to see so many people here. Um, welcome to TUJ if you're from the outside. Um, as you know, tonight the talk will be about Buddhism. Now that is a very heavy subject. Um, and a lot of you have already been studying about it um, in your classes here. So you know something about the story of Siddhartha Gautama. You know something about the seriousness of his quest, his determination, and his great courage. Um, in our classes, you hear lectures, and you've read textbooks, and you've seen DVDs. But tonight, you'll hear a voice coming from the source of the tradition, from within the tradition. Um, Thomas Kirchner is now at, he resides in Kyoto at a Zen monastery, Tenryuji. He studied with one of the leading Zen masters of our times, Roma, uh, uh, Yamada Mumon. Not only that, but he has done scholarly work as well for, uh, for, with literature of the Zen tradition, a lot of translations. For example, in 1975, there was a famous Zen text translated into in English, the records of Rinzai. This is the text here. It took many years to produce this text from the Chinese into the English. And the translation team had lots of notes and uh, extra um, sources of information that were not included in the book. And so recently, Mr. Kirchner took that book with all of the commentaries, edited it, went through the translation, updated it, and produced this book. It's the same text, but now updated. So this is a tremendous contribution to the Zen library, um, a tremendous uh, translation, along with other translations that he has produced. So I think we are honored to have this guest with us tonight. And I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Thomas Yuho Kirchner. Thank you. Okay, well, good evening. Um, I'm happy to be here. This is sort of a homecoming for me in some ways. Um, I knew Professor Roser uh, back in Kyoto. I met him a couple times, actually, although he doesn't remember. Um, <laughs> also, I'm a graduate of Temple University myself. Uh, I never came here to Tokyo. But I did my studies for a master's of education degree in the Osaka campus. Uh, that was back in 1991. It's a bit of a shock to realize that's already been over 25 years ago. Um, but it was a very interesting course. And even though my life has taken a different direction, um, very useful to me. Um, I came here to Japan in 1969, originally on a junior year abroad program from my American college. Uh, as you probably know, for a junior year ab abroad program, the idea is you study in a foreign country for one year, uh, 
and then go back and finish your senior year at your American college, but uh, they never saw me again. Um, it's been almost 50 years now that I've uh, been to Japan. I was already interested in Zen when I first came to Japan, so I sort of suspected I would not be going back. Um, at any rate, uh, I ended up spending about 10 years in Zen monasteries, and after I left, uh, finally finishing my education uh, in colleges here in Japan, Otani University and also later Temple University. Um, this evening, I would like to discuss, well, this, uh, the title of my talk I noticed uh, before was Exploring the Buddhist View of Reality. Uh, well, I'm going to discuss one limited but I think very important aspect of that view of reality. Uh, it's something known in Buddhism as the three marks of existence which refers to the three essential features that Buddhism regards as characterizing everything that exists. These three features are, uh, to give the Sanskrit, dukkha. This is usually translated as suffering. It's not a very good translation, but sort of generally suffering. The fact that life is characterized by a certain in unsatisfactoriness. Uh, the second one is anicca which is usually translated as impermanence, the fact that everything is in a constant state of change. And the third one is anatman. This is usually translated as non-self. This is the Buddhist view that nothing possesses an unchanging substance or essence. Um, these generally, sort of, you know, when we, to Western ears especially, there is a certain negative sense to these that we get. Uh, all this talk about you know, impermanence and suffering, non-self. When I was first studying this in college, uh, even though you know, I, I did, people don't get interested in Buddhism and become Zen monks if they don't you know, feel there's a fair amount of suffering in their own life that they want to resolve, but Nevertheless, you know, I was sort of had this reaction of, you know, why all this focus on the negative side of things? I mean, sure, there's suffering in life, but there's pleasures too. Uh, no need to focus on the negative. And I think that's probably why I became interested in Zen. In Zen, there's a lot of talk about the more positive features, I think, of Buddhism. Enlightenment, living the life of enlightenment. And... The fact is, you know, hearing this back in the States, uh, my thinking about Zen training was pretty simple-minded at the time. I figured, you know, I'd go to Japan, meditate for a few years, maybe live in a monastery for a short time, have enlightenment, solve all my problems, and go back to America and live an ordinary life. Um, unfortunately, things don't really work that way. And as the years passed, I gradually came to feel that the original Buddhist view of what existence is about pretty much says it all. I think this is particularly applicable to the uh, Buddhist stress on the importance of dukkha, this idea of uh, unsatisfactoriness. And in fact, this was central to the Buddha's first teaching, the first thing that he taught after his own experience of enlightenment. Um, these are known as the Four Noble Truths. Maybe you've been introduced, those of you who have studied Buddhism have probably heard of these, but the first being life is suffering, again, dukkha. Uh, number two, suffering is caused by craving. In other words, there is a reason for suffering. Uh, number three, cessation of suffering is possible. And number four, that there is an actual way. There is a path to the cessation of this suffering. Now again, this sort of again sounds like a bit too much focus on this negative, I think. But I don't really believe that uh, it is a negative formation. It's a very positive source of understanding of the human condition, I think. And in many ways, it's an outline of the entire Buddhist path. And in fact, I sort of tend to, I want to 
frame my talk about uh, Buddhism using this, using these four teachings. This sort of negative sense that we have of these Buddhist teachings, I think is partly a matter of expression. Um, certainly in here in Japan, I've noticed that, well, in the time I was in the monastery, that often people are inspired to do their best by pep talks that kind of take a negative approach to things. For example, uh, prior to retreats that we would have, every month we would have a one-week intensive retreat where we focused on nothing but meditation. The Zen master would try to like inspire the Zen monks to greater efforts by saying, you know, if you people don't intend to die in this practice, there's no use even starting. And this seemed to really motivate uh, my Japanese colleagues. Meanwhile, the few Westerners among us were thinking, well, you know, we're interested in meditation, but uh, dying? I don't know. Um, we Westerners, I think, maybe modern Japanese as well, I think tend to respond better to a more positive approach. For example, I've heard one, ma one uh, Zen teacher in America prior to a retreat, I mean, his approach was, he said, look, we're going to have a one-week retreat. It's very intensive. Some of you are beginners. Maybe the best you can do is a 1% effort. But keep in mind that 1% is infinitely more than zero. So, and our response is, well, okay, I can do 1%. And, you know, people start the retreat and they end up giving a 50% effort, which is basically all the Japanese Zen master was probably hoping for anyway. But, you know, we respond better to a positive approach. So with that in mind, I'd like to sort of depart from the usual orthodox Buddhist way of explaining these basic Buddhist teachings and try to give maybe a little more positive spin on it. I think, first of all, though, it's important to understand where these teachings come from. Buddhism is an expression of Indian spirituality. So just, you know, if you really want to understand Christianity, uh, part of what you have got to take into consideration are what are the Jewish roots? What are the Greek roots of Christianity? So what are some basic elements of the Indian spiritual worldview, particularly as related to Buddhism. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit hard to know this. Uh, Indian culture in general, uh, it's not a particularly historical culture. Uh, they're intensely interested in, in philosophy. There are thousands and thousands of books you know, on Indian philosophy, but there's very little history. There's not many records, in other words, of you know which king lived when, did what, uh, when did earthquakes, uh, typhoons, other natural disasters occur. This is quite different than Chinese and European culture. Uh, Chinese, for example, uh, every little event is taken down. And in fact, it's very easy to date events in Chinese history because, for example, lunar eclipses, solar eclipses are always mentioned. And you can calculate very exactly you know, when these occurred. Um, in the case of, well, Indian religious history, we basically are forced to rely on archaeological evidence and also the evidence that exists in the spiritual texts themselves. Um, the earliest texts in uh, Indian religion are the Vedas. These are followed by the Upanishads. So looking at these, some basic uh, elements that reflect, I think are you know, very strongly reflected in Buddhism. One is the concept, uh, my pronunciation of Sanskrit is terrible. Please forgive me if any of you know it. Uh, one is the concept called Rita, which is the principle of a kind of a natural order that regulates the structure and existence and the operation of the universe. Um, 
the idea is that the structure of nature, the function of the gods, the ordering of human society, these are all interdependent and there's a divinely ordained configuration to this. Um, also, this divine order of things, Rita, is supported and strengthened by humankind's observation of the rituals that are dedicated to the gods. So there is a human role in the preservation and strengthening of this divine order. We have an active role in this. Uh, this relates to the concept of the Dharma, which is, nowadays we usually think of this as, you know, the, the Buddhist truth, the Buddhist teaching. But originally this term referred to any of the sort of norms or the behaviors that were in harmony with this cosmic order of Rita. Um, there's a few other things that I think relate very specifically to the way Buddhism developed later. One is the notion of Brahman. Brahman is this idea of an unconditioned universal consciousness that is at work in the creation and maintenance of the world of phenomena, the world of being. Uh, this idea is rather different than the, I, the ancient Middle Eastern idea of God, the creative consciousness, but the tendency in the Middle East was that creation was a, a one-time event and that the world has been left uh, for humankind to perfect. In the Indian outlook, uh, Brahman is always active. It is the unconditioned consciousness that is always creating the world of being anew into existence. Creation is an ongoing event, in other words. Also, Brahman is imminent. It exists in all objects. It is the essence of everything that exists, including us human beings as the essence of individual objects, uh, individual living beings, Brahman is referred to as Atman. Atman is the unconditioned essence that exists in all of our minds. Uh, Atman originally meant breath or wind. Any of, you know that, any of you that might know German, you may know the word Atmen, which means, has that same meaning. In other words, it's something that's invisible and yet has strength and power and the ability to influence the physical world. Um, Atman functions in the world of form, in the world of existence through the forces of karma. Karma originally just meant action, work, action, any of the things that we do. Um, the things that we do create effects. These effects influence what happens to us subsequently. So karma came to have this meaning of a, a sort of a destiny, um, a series of causes and effects that determined you know, the events of our lives. This plays out in a series, according to traditional Indian spiritual thought, uh, as something called samsara, which means, I think, basically in the original language, wandering, uh, rebirth, redeath from one existence to the next, driven by these forces of karma. Um, this kind of worldview, it led to a perception of the human condition, at least, you know, in Indian spirituality, as at best a kind of meaningless repetition of pleasure and pain, at worst, you know, just life after life of suffering. So a kind of a negative worldview, something that we couldn't do anything about because of the, the forces of cause and effect. The best the humans could hope to do was to perform the rituals correctly, uh, pay homage to the gods. In other words, strengthen the forces of the cosmic order, and in that way, you know, at least avoid misfortune. About 2,007 or 800 years ago, this new uh, series of texts known as the Upanishads came into existence. Uh, 
This is about the time of the Buddha, the arise of a number of the new, uh, the later Indian spiritual traditions like Buddhism and Jainism. There was a new concept that emerged with this, and this was the concept of moksha. Moksha means liberation. In other words, the possibility of actually escaping from the cycle of samsara, to getting out of this, you know, apparently preordained cycle of birth and death. Uh, this was done in a number of ways, several different approaches among them. Uh, first of all, asceticism. This was kind of um, various acts and practices that go against our desires, I guess is one way to put it. Uh, the idea being that if samsara, if the world of wandering is driven by karma, karma being acts, well, acts are driven by desires, things that we want to do. So if we sort of go against that, we can, in effect, burn out the forces that cause past karma and thereby escape the samsaric realm. Uh, some of the asceticism that people still do to this, you know, in this present day in India are just almost unbelievable. Um, the Japanese variety shows seem to have a liking for occasionally going to India and um, you know, showing some of the, the holy people the uh, various practices that they engage in. One of them I've heard of is the uh, five fires where you just subsept, you subject yourself to extreme heat. Uh, a fire, two fires in front of you on either side, two fires in back of you. The sun over your head is the fifth fire. In other words, just sub subject yourself to things that you don't really want to do to kind of burn off the forces of karma. Uh, another approach was the, uh, the approach of trance. Usually we think of meditation and trance as being something similar, but they seem to be used in quite different sense here. The explanations I've read uh, of trance in, for example, Indian traditions like the tradition of Ramakrishna, uh, it seems to be a kind of freezing of the mind. In other words, states of consciousness that are so strong, so powerful, that we lose all sense not only of our inner consciousness, but of the outer world. Uh, we kind of stop the mind, the activity of the mind, and the idea is it's like, you know, stopping any input into the forces of, of karma. You have to have actions. Things have to be going on in your mind in order to generate new karma. So if you stop your mind, no new forces are going into karma. So it's like a flywheel on a machine. If you don't feed it any energy, it gradually starts turning slower and slower and slower, and eventually it stops. And as I heard this explained in this Ramakrishna explanation, uh, it's like a leaf on a tree in autumn. Uh, it just dies and your existence drops off and you're free of the world of samsara. This is their explanation of nirvana. The final one I'll explain is what I might call meditation. This is union with the absolute. As I explained a moment ago, there is this idea in s Indian spirituality that the essence of all existence is connected with the unconditioned mind, with Brahman and the expression of Brahman in the individual being, which is Atman. Uh, if through meditation we can see into the true nature of mind and go deeply enough, live a pure life, uh, look into the true nature of the mind, we can actually reconnect with these forces with this unconditioned mind. And since suffering, since karma, since samsara, these are all products of conditioning. Uh, these are the things that lead to suffering. So if we can come to understand, if we can come to have a deep experience of the unconditioned, um, this allows us to see through the forces that drive samsara. 
you can become free of samsara even while remaining in samsara. Uh, in early Buddhism, I mean, the, the ideal was nirvana. People would go on and escape from the world of samsara and just never be reborn again was the idea. But later with the development of Mahayana Buddhism, I don't know if you've heard this in your classes on, on Buddhism, but the ideal became the bodhisattva. Uh, the enlightened being who deliberately remained in the world of samsara, who was reborn into the world and actually didn't try to escape from samsara, didn't try to escape from the world, but actually used the world as a way to help other beings attain liberation. Okay, so um, this is basically, I think this last approach is the one that most accurately typifies the approach of Buddhism. Uh, to explain a little bit about the background of Buddhism proper, um, well, uh, Sensei just said that you, you've heard a little bit about the story of the Buddha. Um, can I assume that all of you know that? Just, just to go over it very uh, a brief summary, the idea was that uh, the Buddha um, again, we don't really have an accurate biography. Uh, again, this non-historical nature of uh, much of Buddhist, uh, of Indian culture, I think, is part of the issue. But there's kind of a general holy man biography in India. There are traditional biographies of the Buddha, of course, but if you read the biography of the founder of the Jain tradition, it turns out to be exactly the same biography. But there's something there. I mean, even if the biography is completely legendary, they, they are conveying a certain truth. So um, the biography is that the Buddha was born into extremely, uh, what can I say, um, positive circumstances. He was the prince of a small kingdom in what is now Nepal, uh, as was the custom in those days when an important person like this was born. The parents would call in a sage that would read the fortune of, you know, the new child. And the sage that came in and read the fortune of the newly born Buddha said that this young baby is going to grow up to be either a great sage that will save the world or a great king that will rule the world. So his father, the king, of course, desired to have a, you know, a, a successor to the kingdom and was not interested in having a son that would grow up and become a holy man and leave the worldly life. So he thought, well, what is it that drives a person toward religion? It's an understanding of human suffering, so I will do everything I can to prevent this young child from experiencing any, su any suffering. So as the baby grew up into childhood and young manhood, uh, the king would not allow any sick people into the palace. He would not allow any old people. He would not allow the young prince to experience the fact of death, uh, see any of this. Um, wouldn't be allowed outside of the confines of this wonderful sort of little paradise that the king tried to create inside the palace walls. But eventually, the prince became curious about what lied outside of the walls, so he asked his charioteer if he could please show him secretly what was going on in the outside world. So the legend goes that on four successive nights, the two of them left the palace and saw what was going on. First night, the prince went out on the streets and saw a sick person and asked his chario charioteer, well, what's this? And the charioteer explained, well, you know, people aren't healthy all the time. Uh, we do occasionally get sick. So uh, the prince learned the fact of sickness. The second night they went out and he saw an old person um, and asked, what was that? Well, eventually, you know, we're not young our whole lives, we get old. Third night, they went out and the prince saw a funeral. What's going on here? Well, eventually, uh, people get old and die. Uh, 
This is a fact of life. So on the fourth evening when they went out again, they saw a holy person on the street. And the young prince asked, what, what is that man doing? And the charioteer explained, well, he is looking, uh, this is a man who's dedicated his life to searching uh, for an answer to the question of human suffering. So thereupon, uh, the prince named Siddhartha uh, decided that he too would become a, a holy person and left, uh, left the palace and engaged on spiritual practice. So uh, he first of all went to uh, the two greatest teachers of trance meditation. He was a very, very able student. Uh, he very quickly mastered the techniques and became you know, the preeminent disciple of these teachers who wanted to make him uh, their successor. But he wasn't satisfied. He felt, well, look, this, this kind of gives me a temporary escape from the question of suffering, but it doesn't really resolve the problem. I don't want to escape suffering. I, know, I want to know what's involved. I want to understand the mechanics of it. So next, he tried the path of asceticism. Uh, very, very intense asceticism. They describe in the old text the sort of things he did. Uh, for example, uh, extreme fasting. There was a certain practice known as the practice of, uh, what was it, the 30 beans? He would start out a month with 30 beans, eating 30 beans only in one day. And then the next day he would get down 29 beans, the next day to 28. At the end of the month he was down to a single bean, and then he would go back work up to 28 beans again. But eventually he got so thin, uh, according to the old text, that you could see his backbone through his stomach. Uh, some of the old uh, imagery, the uh, statues of him that were carved in Gandala actually show this. So finally he got so weak that when one day when he went to bathe in the river, he collapsed and couldn't stand again until a milkmaid came along and gave him some milk to recover. So he decided that this was not getting him anywhere and he engaged in the practice of meditation and with that he had his enlightenment. Um, his first teaching after the, his experience of enlightenment were his realizations about the nature of reality. Those were the ones I mentioned before, the Four Noble Truths. Life is suffering. Suffering is caused by craving. Sensation of suffering is possible. And there is a way to the, sens to the sensation of suffering. Um, Again, as I mentioned, we Westerners particularly tend to find this a little off-putting, but from the in -world, Indian world view, it's quite understandable. As I mentioned, this idea of samsara uh, tended to result in a rather negative view of human existence. And often, um, it was re regarded as kind of an insolvable problem. But the Buddhist message is kind of positive because, well, actually, there is a reason for this. And if there's a reason, then if we understand that reason, the, sens the, sens the cessation of suffering becomes possible. And not only that, there is a concrete way to attain this liberation. Um, well, that's what this meant for the ancient Indians, maybe. But how about us, you know, in the modern world. I think maybe it's good here to explain a little bit more about what is intended. I've been, in, you know, translating this term as suffering. But again, as I mentioned, it's closer actually to the sense of unease, unsatisfactory. I mean, a lot of people do experience abject suffering in this world. I mean, if we look around and look at all the wars going on, uh, people building up security and things to rely on all their life, and then a hurricane or a tsunami or something comes along and washes it all away. I mean, there is a lot of this real, honest, you know, to goodness suffering. But even if you avoid that, there is this underlying 
you know, what the American thinker Thoreau meant when he said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. This sense that we often have, of, you know, everything seems to be going well, but there's got to be something more. So, with that in mind, um, this being what is intended by suffering, uh, let's go over these four truths one by one. First, life is suffering. Again, so a few, few more words on this issue. Uh, it may sound a little bit extreme to say that life itself is suffering. I mean, you know, if you ask people, uh, I think there have been surveys made, are you satisfied with your life? And most people tend to say, yeah, generally, I'm kind of satisfied with my life. Uh, I think one way to understand this teaching is that the sort of people that would have been attracted to Shakyamuni and his teachings, the sort of people that would want to have followed his path and become his disciples, were almost certainly people that actually did feel that life was suffering. I mean, you don't give up the pleasures and pains of marriage and, you know, physical comforts and, you know, live the life of a wanderer in northern India if you're not, don't have this sense of suffering or, you know, ordinary life as suffering. Um, in all the years I spent in the monastery and in all my years of temple life, you know, I have met a number of blessed people who seem to glow, you know, with this inner light of joy and peace. And sometimes I've asked them, you know, well, why exactly did you become a monk or a nun? And I have yet to meet a single one of them that said, well, yeah, I guess I was always basically happy, but I had this draw to monastic life, and that's why I became a nun. You know, they always say that when they were young, they had this uh, inability to find any kind of happiness in the sort of things that, you know, normal people looking for happiness for. Um, security, a good job, et cetera, et cetera. So, Part of this teaching, I think, is simply a statement of how life actually feels for the type of people who take up spiritual practice. But I don't think that this is what the Buddha meant entirely. I don't think he intended this first noble truth to be limited to those with a spiritual vocation. Uh, certainly, I mean, if you take the original Indian spiritual view of rebirth, redeath, this reincarnation and samsara into consideration, this was a much more general truth. Uh, for example, I mean, if a person, even if a person was quite satisfied with the circumstances of their present life, or even if they were living a heavenly life, you know, heaven, the heavens were one of the six realms of existence in Buddhism, even then, this kind of satisfaction would have been regarded as simply increasing your attachment to the samsaric realm. Even the heavens were in the realms of samsara. And with this attachment, you would gradually exhaust the good karma that gave you that good life or that heavenly birth. And this would lead eventually to rebirths in lower realms, maybe even a few rounds in hell. And this would go on and on and on for as long as it took for you to address the causes that kept you in this realm of samsara. But even if you don't believe in samsara, I mean, as I think most Westerners don't, I think that most of us, I think, at least the people I've talked to, I met a few people that claim that they've never suffered, uh, and I actually believe a few of them. They've always been very, very self, you know, selfless, very, very giving people. But I think most of us would agree with this um, statement. One great philosopher, a uh, man named Krishnamurti once said, we live on the edge of sorrow. I think we can see this, you know, in the, well, in the possibility of these unforeseen events that I, I mentioned the hurricanes and tsunamis and all of these other sickness, whatever that comes along and takes away everything that we've relied on for our happiness. But again, um, even if we avoid those things, this kind of deep undercurrent of suffering that exists, uh, 
suffering that we tend to kind of put off or ignore or deny or distract from ourselves, but you know, eventually catches up with us in the form of illness or impending death. Um, I think also most of us have this very deep desire for permanent meaning, a permanent happiness, a happiness that is free of conditions, that doesn't rely on good health or financial security or something like that. And if we seek happiness in those things, ultimately we can't find it there. So I think another reason for this teaching of the Buddha was it was an attempt by the Buddha to sensitize people to this underlying unease, dissatisfaction in life, so that you know they could reorder their priorities in life in such a way that they might better be able to address this kind of suffering when it eventually appeared. Um, I should say that even if you turn to spiritual practice as a way to resolve these problems, it's not quite that simple. Uh, very often, as a Zen monk myself, you know, people will come to me and say, look, I've been practicing meditation for years, uh, and yet every time I do a retreat, I'm like depressed for a week or two. Um, yeah, I, I think we tend to have this idea, you know, since Buddhism talks so much about resolving the problem of suffering, that, okay, if we start meditation, Buddhist meditation, then, well, okay, we start our practice with X amount of suffering. So if we practice for a year, that should mean X amount of suffering minus a year of meditation, and two years should be X amount of suffering minus two years of meditation. But why isn't this happening? Um, well, it's again, it's not <laughs> that simple. Uh, often you have to experience a greater sense of suffering because I think we spend, we expend a lot of energy distracting ourselves from the suffering that's already there. And when you meditate, this is opened up to you. You have to uh, come to really terms with what you know, the true nature of your spiritual condition is. And this is actually an advantage. I mean, if you want to achieve any kind of transformative growth, you have to start from where you actually are. If you're doing any kind of you know, attempt at growth based on illusions that you have about yourself, you're just going to be piling one illusion on top of another. Okay, uh, this brings us to the second noble truth, uh, which is the cause of dukkha. Um, traditionally, Buddhism identifies this cause as craving, but I think another way to express it, I've heard it defined as fixation, which I kind of like, because uh, it suggests this desire that the human mind has to control reality for its own benefit, either by hanging on to what's pleasant or stonewalling against that which is unpleasant. Um, problem is that we can't fixate things. Um, the attempt to fixate things actually causes suffering because things can't be fixated, because things are in a constant state of change, and this stage of change is known as you know, in, in anicca, impermanence. Um, this teaching has various meanings. I think one is the ordinary meaning of, you know, like anything that has a shape, all the things around us, our lives, uh, even this earth itself will eventually disappear. So everything that has form will every, you know, eventually break down. But I think there's a deeper sense to this too, uh, particularly in later forms of Buddhism like Mahayana Buddhism, which is the idea that fundamentally, Oh no, everything that exists is in a constant process of change. Nothing ever exists, even for the briefest moment, in a state that is free of change. In this sense, I think Buddhism is very much in line with the teachings of modern physics, modern science. I don't want to say, you know, the Zen masters and Buddhist masters were quantum physicists, but, you know, it's a valid analogy, I think. Uh, modern physics teaches us that, you know, E equals mc squared, that mass matter is 
you know, if you go to its essence, it's just energy. It's, you know, moving. It's in a constant process of change. Um, for example, one of the difficulties in studying electrons and other subatomic particles is that they're never still for a single moment. They're always winking in and out of existence. So in that sense, you know, the process of creation is always going on. Things are not just going. Impermanence does, doesn't mean things going out of existence. It also means things coming into existence. And one, you know, I was giving a talk once to a, a group of older people, and one of them after the talk came up and says, you know, I'm a, I'm a retired quantum physicist, and I was interested in what you said about uh, this Buddhist teaching of impermanence. And we quantum physicists, we've reached the point where we can't conceive of the universe as the way it is without positing the existence of an underlying consciousness. Um, Anyway, uh, the upshot of this with relating, relating to uh, the problem of dukkha is that if constant change is the nature of existence, if we're looking for happiness and meaning in certain things not changing, like our financial security or good health, then we're bound to be dissatisfied because that's going against the very fabric of the universe. Um, I think... Let me skip ahead to something, something very central to this whole problem of dukkha. Uh, this problem of clinging, actually, is very intimately connected with something that is actually our greatest gift as human beings, which is the gift of thought, an improper use of thought. Um, thought again, is our greatest gift. It's, you know, it's allowed us to create this wonderful civilization that we have around us to create all this philosophy that we've done. And yet problems arise because we identify so strongly with thought. In fact, you know, we allow thought to define what we are. Uh, I once heard, you know, recently a comment in a book somewhere, you know, Aren't we nothing but the sum total of all our thoughts? Well, religion would say no. And meditation is an attempt to prove to ourselves that no, we're not just the sum total of our thoughts. But we don't know anything else but thoughts. And this is something that I think Buddhism is very much on the same page as modern psych uh, psychology <laughs> is. Um, when psychology talks about the self, the ego, well, what is this? You know, we're born in a certain country, uh, raised by certain parents, we absorb certain values from the people around us, we go to school, we learn certain things, uh, depending on, you know, the way we look, our intelligence, our various abilities, et cetera, et cetera. We have a whole bunch of experiences which, you know, leave us with this huge collection of memories and images and opinions and grudges and whatever have you. And at some point in our life, according to psychology, we synthesize this into a story about what we are. And this is the ego. I mean, the ego, according to psychology, is basically nothing but a story, a narrative that we have that explains who we are, what the world is, what the appropriate way to respond to the world is, et cetera, et cetera. But it's basically nothing but a thought construct, and it's constantly changing. But this is all we know, and we think that's who we are. And this identification with thought causes suffering in a lot of ways. Uh, if we identify with thought completely, for example, well, first of all, we can, you know, it causes suffering where no suffering exists. Um, there is an American writer that I think all of, certainly the Americans here are aware of, uh, Mark Twain. He always has the appropriate quote. He said, you know, when he was getting old, uh, he looked back on his life and said, my life has been filled with tragedies and misfortunes, some of which actually happened. We end up, you know, creating all of this misery that actually never turns out you know, to come true, so useless suffering. Another thing is that if our thoughts turn dark, 
I think everyone who thinks about life, you know, particularly the world being the way it is now, thoughts turn dark sometimes. And if you identify, if thought defines your mind, then one dark thought can lead to another, and this can lead to a downward spiral that results in depression or suicide in a worst case. Um, this identification with thought, again, it can create suffering from what are mere facts. For example, pain is just a fact. Pain is the body telling you that something is wrong in your body or your mind, and you better do something about it. The trouble is, though, that we tend to mix a lot of thoughts into this and through thought to resist it. Why is this happening? Uh, this is because I did this and that's punishment, or it's because some person did this to me and it's all there, et cetera, et cetera. We end up resisting pain, and pain times resistance equals suffering. And we do the same thing with pleasure. Pleasure is just the body telling us that, you know, nature is telling us we're doing something that nature wants us to do, eating, for example. But we add thought to this. Wow, that dessert was good. I think I'll have another one uh, and another one. And pretty soon, uh, pleasure also becomes pl pain, uh, suffering, I'm sorry. Pleasure, so pleasure times clinging uh, equals suffering. Another thing, I mean, if self is defined by this narrative, anything that threatens that narrative, anything from an insult to the way we think we look, all the way up to our world view. If our world view, if our religion is nothing but a thought system, then any thought system that threatens that is extremely painful and extremely dangerous. I mean, this is the cause of religious wars. Um, I could go on and on about this. Uh, we're approaching 8 o'clock, though, so let me hurry on. What do we do about this? This is the third noble truth. There is you know, a reason for this, and it can be overcome. How do we overcome? Uh, I had some words here about the Eightfold Noble Path, but let me abbreviate that. Basically, what it comes down to, uh, these are you know, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right understanding, right in tension, but summing up, basically what the Buddha was saying is, first of all, get your life in order. Uh, this is what he means by right work, right livelihood, right action, right words. You know, Don't say things. Don't do things. Don't make your living doing things that hurt yourself and other people. Create a foundation for living a good, clean life. Second one is, well, it's basically the practice of meditation. Um, change your mind in such a way that you make yourself available to wisdom, makes it possible to live a life of wisdom. Uh, live l wisdom being an understanding of the true nature of reality as impermanent and as non-self. And right intention with that understanding, your will, you will naturally desire to do that which is right and non-harmful and in line with the nature of reality. Um, well, the central problem that I just talked about is this question of human thought. So if thought is what causes, for example, misconceptions about self and the nature of reality, how can we deal with thought? How can we deal with a problem of thought? And that is what meditation is basically about. It is an attempt to address this problem of thought, and this involves, in meditation, two basic approaches. One is anyone who's interested in meditation, whether it's Christian, Islamic, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, New Age, a lot of the New Age meditation is quite good, actually, I think. They always stress mindfulness. In other words, being in the present moment. Um, the reason for this is Thought is always of the past or the future. It's based on our experience. Something happens, we immediately refer to our past experience, what's going on here. We use that to interpret the appropriate thing to do in any situation, etc. It always brings us into the past. 
if you're completely in the present moment, you can't always be in the present moment. I mean, thought is necessary in a lot of the things we do, of course. You can't fill out your taxes if you're in the present moment all the time. But knowing this present moment, knowing what it is to be in the present moment is to know what it is to be free of thought, to just be as it is, to be aware. And there is in this part of the answer to this problem of suffering is that there is an inherent joy in being in the present moment. Uh, if you ask these guys that, you know, go to Portugal and surf 20 meter waves or free solo, you know, 1,000 meter cliffs or something, or even do things like, you know, horse racing or something, you know, they'll tell you that the reason they do this, the reason they're willing to risk their lives to do this, is because it really pulls them into the present moment. And there's an inherent joy in that. You can't be thinking about what you did this morning or about what you're going to do tonight or whatever, you know. Uh, so one way to define meditation is it's a way to learn to be completely open to and relaxed toward the present moment without having to put your life at risk or without having to have something outside of yourself, like a hobby that is so pleasurable that it pulls you into the present moment. So that's one thing. Um, aside from that, though, like a spiritual element, I have friends, you know, they're Christian monks, and you ask them about their meditation, and one thing they identify is something called the sacrament of the present moment. Now, a sacrament is anything that brings you closer to God, to the divine. So why is the present moment a sacrament? Well, the monks say, look, the only time that God can manifest in your life is the present moment. He can't manifest in your past. I mean, that's gone. Future, that's not a reality. So the more you're in a present moment, the more opportunities you're giving to God to manifest in your life. So that spiritual aspect. I'm also tempted to, again, connect this with science. As I mentioned, that you know, the act of creation, according to modern science, is constantly ongoing. And there is, as this quantum physicist said to me, you know, we have to posit the notion for existence to be possible of an underlying consciousness. So if, you know, if the act of creation is always going on in the present moment, if our meditation brings us into the present moment, we are in fact bringing ourselves closer to the act of creation. And one, I think, definition of enlightenment is a reconnection with this creative consciousness. Okay, uh, well, to sort of hurry to my conclusion, how many people actually get this? I mean, how many people through meditation? Uh, well, actually, I should mention one other thing. Um, I think being in the present moment is quite difficult for us. So another practice that I think is very helpful in other meditative practices is actually using thought to get beyond thought. Um, there's many ways to do this. One way that I learned that was very, very helpful, uh, if you have a difficult problem, to break it down into its constituent parts. And what are the constituent parts of thought? Well, if you really get to the basic I think you can say only three. There is thought as visual imagery, thought as verbal activity, you know, sentences, snatches of old songs, all the way up to complete novels in your mind, and physical sensations that are strong enough to impose themselves on your consciousness. So the form of meditation that I learned using this is you just sort of step back from the thinking process and start observing it what's happening from moment to moment. So every few seconds you just label the activity of your mind. Is this body? Is this bodily sensations? Is it body? Is it image? Is it talk? Or is it a combination of these things? So every few seconds just calmly identify what your mind is doing. So, you know, you go and meet the teacher a couple times during the retreat. Teacher asked me how it was going and I says, yeah, I can sort of you know, your mind sensitizes itself to this. And you can learn to identify these things in real time. And he says, fine. Okay, to keep doing that, but I want you, if when the time comes to label, 
if none of those three is present, just say nothing. So I noticed, yeah, that there, there is these natural gaps between the thoughts. And I remember it in some of the old Chinese texts, this advice, be very aware and very careful of the gaps between the thoughts. And I wondered, what? Gaps between the thoughts? I've never noticed any gaps between the thoughts. You know, you have to sort of sensitize your mind to this, I think. And you notice that, yeah, there are times when the mind is inherently quiet. And if you can be as open to and aware of those times as you are to the activity of the mind, the body image and the talk, you'll notice that the next thought that comes, it's not on the same level as the silence. There's a sort of, you know, you're just watching the silence with openness, you know, and relaxation. You'll notice that the next thought sort of stop, starts as a movement of mental energy, like something upwelling out of water. Um, the image that came to me was like these old Japanese monster movies where Godzilla comes out of the ocean, you know, this sort of, the surface of the water goes like, what? And then Godzilla comes out. Well, a thought is kind of like that. There's this upwelling of mind energy, and then then the thought appears. But if you identify it and just let it go, then it's gone. But if you can stay relaxed enough toward it, that mind energy can well up and dissipate and never form a thought at all. So when they talk about silence in meditation, they're not talking about a forcible shutting up of the mind. I think this is the biggest mistake that people make in meditation. They say, you know, the tranquility of the mind, the silence of the mind, and what we end up doing is creating a thought of silence and trying to use that as a lid to shut up the activity of the mind, and it doesn't work because it's on exactly the same level. What we're trying to do in meditation is open ourselves to the natural silence of the mind and let that expand, you know, into our entire life. So, uh, again, how many people actually attain this? I think some people I know in Japan, I mean, really have reconnected with this creative consciousness. I can't claim to. But I think, nevertheless, you know, the practice of meditation is very useful in addressing these questions of human dissatisfaction for a number of reasons. First of all, I mean, just the simple fact of knowing that we're not defined by our thought, I think, is normal. You know, it's enormously liberating. Um, knowing that we're not defined by our thought allows us to actually break s cycles of, you know, downward cycles of dark thought. In fact, the times of dark thought can actually be, you know, the most useful because they're unpleasant and we want to see what's really going on. Another thing is that by learning to be sensitive to the rising of thought, we can actually see thoughts as they start to come up. So much of our, you know, our activities in life are the results of, what can I say, reaction rather than response. Something happens, you know, that guy that really gets on your nerves says something, and before you know it, there's this flash of anger, this reaction of anger, and you say something you later regret. Well, if you learn to meditate, you can actually see that. It's very quick but you can see that reaction coming, and at that point, it's just energy. You can take that energy and do anything you want with it. You know, you can make a joke or let it go or whatever, but you're not in the control of your reactions anymore. You can respond rather than react. Um, I think all of these things, you know, they, they result, this observing of the mind, they result in a fundamental shift in the way that we respond to difficult situations, to the suffering of our lives. I think our natural tendency in uncomfortable situations is to kind of physically express it, is to tighten up and turn away. But what meditation teaches us, whether the problem is the problem of thought, or issues that come up in our life, or inner pain, the suffering. Um, the most effective way to respond 
is not to tighten up and turn away. This is resistance to thought. That never works. The acceptance of thought and just, you know, being so open to and relaxed toward it that can well up and dissipate. Um, this is not tighten up and turn away, but open up and turn toward. It's a different sort of physical and mental posture that we have to the whole question of suffering. Um, we don't escape from suffering, in a sense, but we escape into suffering. Um, this may not seem like all that effective a way to deal with some of the real suffering we have in our lives, but I do think that it does have the potential to really allow us to deal with whatever life can throw at us. Uh, some of you may have read a book called Man's Search for Meaning by a man called Viktor Frankl. He was uh, a Jewish psychologist, actually, who was in a Nazi concentration camp. And basically, by using this escaping into approach, by accepting wholeheartedly whatever came his way, uh, he not only lived through that experience in the concentration camp, but came out with an extremely positive view of what life meant uh, and what you know, mental health involved. So um, the time being what it is, I'd like to leave a little bit of time for questions, so I will end with that. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our uh, guests for giving us this uh, really inspiring lec lecture and really insightful le lecture. Um, I'm, ge I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So since we're over time, uh, we shall start uh, taking questions. I have a microphone here. So we'll pass you the mic and just. Thank you very much. All right, good evening, sir, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Sir Don Hurtado, and it's a pleasure to have you here, sir. And my first question is. First? If, <laughs> well, my, my, my question is, <laughs> sorry, okay. I, I do have others. If achieving nirvana is the ultimate goal, it means that we will be free from the illusion of conscious, then how will we be able to know when we achieve nirvana if we have no conscious? Oh, I don't think that's what nirvana is, actually. Um, when Buddhism originally talked of nirvana, um, it was really just a seeing through the a seeing through the mechanics of suffering. Uh, it was not. I, I think the, the the sort of state that you're talking about there is more the, the sort of trance state that I mentioned, which connected in original Indian. Uh, spiritual thought, I think, with the notion of nirvana as an escape from the world of samsara. And that would occur after death. So we don't know what happens after death. So good question, actually. But I think in the Buddhist sense, um, nirvana just does not involve in any way an extinction of consciousness. And in fact, it's, it's sort of a hundred percent it's a 100% state of awareness and wakefulness, if anything. You're aware of every thought that arises. You're not caught by it. Uh, when thought is useful, you can use it. Uh, when it's not useful, I mean, all of this, so much negative thinking is just this, you know, he said, she said, I should have said, sort of like, complete waste of spiritual energy. Just let all that go, you know. So uh, I would say it, it's more like complete consciousness, uh, consciousness that's free and actually frees the mind. The most enlightened people I've met uh, are really in some ways the most active, uh, most efficiently active, usually great you know, communicators as well. So it's a very active state, actually. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah. it does. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please feel free to ask anything, personal questions, whatever, yeah. We have here. Okay. Hello. Um, thank you for the uh, presentation. One 
kind of hypothetical question, but let's say your 10-year-old self received a letter from you in, from mm -hmm. the present saying that in the future you will come to Japan, become a monk, and do all these sorts of you know, uh, spiritual, spiritual things. What would your reaction have been? Mm, 10 years old. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't have believed it, maybe. I mean, I certainly had a, absolutely no idea that I was going to be doing this. Um, in fact, the first time I saw a picture of Zen monks sitting in a meditation hall in a, my book of Buddhism, you know, <laughs> back in a college in America, I like sent cold shivers down my spine. So um, it was only... I was actually a lay monk. I started getting into this, and it was sort of like, well, this isn't working, so I'll try the next step. Maybe I'll, I'll live in an ordinary temple. And OK, well, I've got to go a little bit deeper. I'll, I'll live in a monastery, but I won't get ordained. I'll just be a lay person. And well, maybe I ought to get ordained also. One thing led to another. Um, yeah, uh, I think my later self, 10 years old, I was you know, I had a pretty normal childhood. I wasn't one of these people that went through a terrible childhood and like gave me all sorts of problems that I wanted to solve. <laughs> but it was later, I think the real sort of questions about life and the sense of meaninglessness came to me more like when I was about 17 or 18. And yeah, at that point I'd really reached the end of my rope. I mean, I just didn't see anything in life that would mean anything to me. And coming here to Japan and starting this, I mean, my, I literally sweat blood for years because my legs are so stiff, you know, and, but what was the alternative? I didn't have it, you know. So I think at that point, if I'd received a letter <laughs> saying that, yeah, I, I think I would have taken it rather positively. All right, well, yeah. thank you. Yeah. You want to hear, please? Uh, thank you very much for coming to TUJ. Um, my question, I think, is a little bit more, uh, maybe a little bit more personal. But I was first mm -hmm. exposed to some of the restrictions after listening to Zhang Kuan talk about culinary restrictions in Buddhism. Mm. So I was just kind of wondering if uh, what what are the other restrictions that you know a monk has to kind of live by and avoid and that sort uh -huh. of thing. Uh. Asking a monk who has been a monk in Japan that question <laughs> is quite different than asking a monk who's been in China or Burma <laughs> that question. Um, first of all, there is this idea that Buddhism is strictly vegetarian. Actually, the original Buddhist monks were beggars and uh, had to eat whatever they were given. And if that was meat, they were I mean, it was given to them, so they had to give it. The only restriction was they could not eat meat that from an animal that had been killed deliberately for them. The uh, impression that, well, vegetarianism in Buddhism, which of course definitely does exist, is a Chinese um, development, I might say, because uh, the Taoist holy person, in China is very strictly vegetarian. And the Buddhists, holy people, were sort of competing with them in a way. Um, so Buddhism became very, very strictly vegetarian and remains very strictly vegetarian in China today. All this means is, though, I mean, they've developed a very strong vegetarian culture, which combined with the Chinese genius for cuisine has resulted in this mind-blowing vegetarian, you know, variety of vegetarian cooking that they have. So it ends up being no sacrifice whatsoever. I've been to a vegetarian restaurant in Taiwan that was like hundreds of different things you can eat. Vegetarian sushi, et cetera, et cetera. So um, other things, though, uh, celibacy has always been very strong. Um, however, again, this depends on the culture. Uh, Southeast Asia, uh, China, Korea, where, again, the image, the cultural image of the holy person has always been that of a person who remains celibate. 
uh, other cultures, well, this is not an Asian culture, but like, for example, in Jewish culture, the idea toward marriage is quite different. Um, marriage, children, these are regarded as ennobling or maturing, that a person who has not been through marriage and child raising, for example, is not even qualified to begin a life of meditation because they don't really understand what life is about. Um, the Jew Jewish background is that, of course, but in many ways that reminds me of the situation here in Japan. Um, I have heard from monks that even in the old days, this idea of priestly celibacy never 100% made sense. Um, people that are deeply involved in the life of meditation, of course, they don't have time for that maybe, but there was a tendency among the older sects like Tendai and Shingon for the monks, the priests to live up in the mountains and the families to kind of like <laughs> be in little temples below the mountain. Um, traditions like the Pure Land traditions, Shin Buddhism, very quickly, a, a thousand years ago, instituted priestly marriage. Nowadays, almost all of the traditions are married, married traditions in Japan. Uh, this is also true in Tibet and Mongolia, which I think have certain cultural similarities to Japan. Uh, Nepal also, the Buddhist priesthood is married. So again, it, some c cultural determination. Uh, another one that has turned out to be a little bit flexible is alcohol. Uh, South Asia, basically very, very strict um, prohibition against alcohol. Uh, this again, it's universal. It's not just Buddhism. It, it's all, you know, the holy person does not drink alcohol because this is said to confuse the mind. However, you get to Japan and alcohol is a drink of the gods. I mean, you go to, to, to the Shinto shrines and all of these big tubs you see, these are offerings of sake. So it never, again, quite computed with the Japanese what should be wrong with drinking alcohol. It's like telling a Swede that they can't drink milk, you know. So even, you know, one of the things, <laughs> again, I was mentioning the historical consciousness. The Japanese uh, temples have kept very careful records, uh, which still exist, some, you know, from some temples 1,500 years ago or so, not quite that long, but 12, 1,300 years ago. And right there in the ledger is the weekly purchase of sake, you know, along with all the other stuff they bought. Um, I, I sort of hate to say this in front of a disillusion anybody here, but some of the greatest drinkers I've ever met have been Zen masters. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the truth. They, they just they don't really see any problem here. And uh, I think Buddhism, in a way, it's flexible. Uh, it adjusts itself to cultural norms. Basically, though the the teaching of Buddhism, I mean, what does it really boil down to? And it is a short one sentence phrase uh, in the Dhammapada, which is one of the, you know, it's supposed to be one of the earliest, the most basic of the Buddhist texts. Do no evil, do good, and purify your mind. Do no evil, do no good, that's universal. But I think the distinctly Buddhist thing is purify the mind. If drinking alcohol doesn't get in the way with that, okay, no problem. Unfortunately, it does with some people, and my Buddhist friends are not very positive about that, but in and of itself, they don't see a problem. Marriage, depending on the person, I can think of a number of people uh, who probably would have been a lot better off spiritually if they had gotten married instead of like sticking through life as a single person. Um, situational in a certain sense. I'm speaking again as a Japanese Buddhist. Uh, these things, these rules are much more cut and dry, much, you know, much stricter in certain other countries, but I think it is important to know that there is a certain flexibility. I don't know if that has clarified your question or <laughs> confused it, but I mean, I'm not married, but, uh, but I do drink a little bit, not too much. <laughs> Uh, so one of the words you mentioned a lot is the word notion. Uh, 
So uh, if notion of impermanence, is that notion permanent? And if the notion is permanent, can we say that the un underlying real reality or the essence of the universe is actually notion and maybe, it, I, I don't know if I'm making sense here, but like mm. God or uh, Dharma is actually some kind of universal notion that we as human can connect to. Yeah, I don't know if, I'm, if I understand you exactly what you mean. Um, we end up interpreting these things according to our own preconceptions of, do you mean notion, I mean thought itself? Thought or? Maybe like consciousness or? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean I think one way of looking at notion is just idea or thought. And Buddhism, certainly, you know, the, the meditative traditions of Buddhism would say that this is not a reality. This is a construct of the conditioned mind based on our experience. So it's limited, and therefore, it, this can't be what God is or something. But another notion of, uh, another view of maybe what you're talking about, notion, is principle. Um, and in that sense, yeah, a, a principle, an abstract, um, like, truth. I mean, this is something that the human mind, the limited conditioned human mind, can't entirely grasp. But it is a principle, um, something we can aim for. And yes, I, I would say, you know, it is a reality. But is it, is it a reality that we can understand with this mind that only knows that which we have experienced? No. Uh, what we're trying to do in meditation is to access those levels of the mind that are no longer defined by limited thought. So, in other words, notions as thought. But hopefully, yeah. I mean, throughout all history, religions have aimed at a deeper experiential understanding of principles. So. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I have a question about, so in, in, when you, in your talk you said it was something about how going for goals like, like uh, wealth or financial security, mm. things like that, they don't really have, they're not a real solution to our problems. Uh, at college, at least a lot of our goal is for financial security, is for those jobs. As a school, are we going sort of away from enlightenment, would you say? No, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think Buddhism would agree to that either. Uh, I think, you know, Shakyamuni Buddha wouldn't agree with that because some of his greatest disciples were extremely rich men. <laughs> In fact, the, uh, the first temples were built uh, there's a story, I, I forget his name, but he was a, a layperson, uh, very, very generous, uh, gave to charity all the time, but extremely wealthy. And he wanted to build a temple for the wandering early Buddhist monks, you know, Shakyamuni and his disciples, to stay in during the rainy season. So there was this perfect location, but it happened to be owned by a certain aristocrat who didn't want to sell it. So when the rich man approached him and said, please uh, allow me to buy it, he said, okay, I'll let you buy it, but on one condition. That is that you, in, you cover the entire surface of the park with gold. So this guy had that much money. <laughs> And he was still like one of the greatest lay disciples of the Buddha. And in fact, there's an entire sutra, the Vilamakirti Sutra, that's about a fabulously wealthy lay person who is actually uh, the deepest into the life of meditation and wisdom. So the idea is that these things in and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with them. The problems arise when we use them to create our identity and feel that we are going to attain some kind of happiness beyond conditions just by having enough money or just by always being healthy or something like that. 
Um, you know, living like a monk, to be perfectly honest, this is a very rare vocation. Most people do not do well <laughs> living celibate lives. Um, you know, this is, this is something for a rather unusual personality. So a certain amount of financial security, I think, is important for the average person. They've, they've been doing studies on happiness, which I think are very interesting. Um, my younger brother had a friend, uh, a very interesting guy, who was a speed freak at one point in his life, but came up with a lot of interesting insights. And one of the things he said that I thought was particularly interesting was, he said, there's only two kinds of money. Enough money and not enough money. So if you don't have enough money, psychologists have found that it's very, very difficult to be happy. I mean, certain geniuses can live as beggars and be happy, but generally speaking, it's very, very hard. Once you have enough money, um, there is a level of happiness that no matter how much more money you get, does not increase. This is the interesting thing. So yeah, I mean, studying so that, you know, if, you, if you're not interested in becoming a monk and want to live a lay life, certainly, I mean, it's very much to your benefit to study in such a way that you can more or less guarantee that you'll be financially secure for your whole life. But where you go from there, you know, where are you going to find real meaning in life? Where are you going to find real happiness in life? Where are you going to be able to live in such a way, you know, that when the time comes to die, I mean, I've gotten sick once and really thought I was going to die. Uh, cancer of the pancreas, and I thought it was, you know, surgery and the whole thing. And you realize how short life is. And, you know, the last thing you want at that point, and we will all come to the time where we're facing death, is looking back on your life and realizing you've wasted it. There's nothing more painful than doing that. So what is it that I can do? You know, how can I live in such a way that I can look back? It's not the same for everyone. I mean, like I said, becoming a monk, <laughs> that's, that's an answer for just a few people. But I think everyone, you know, there's a certain something in their life, you know. What is it that you're willing to sacrifice for? You know, what principle? Um, after that, you know, you just live in accordance with that. Take that as far as you can do it. I think that's what's important. Okay, one last question. Yeah. Thanks again, Mr. Uh, Kershaw, for coming. Um, my question is, um, how, would, how do you think you could relate the ideas of Buddhism, mainly impermanence and anatman, to the allegory of the cave? Ah, the allegory of the cave, as I understand it, um, it's Plato's allegory of the cave, right? Yeah. The idea that there is a world of realities that is separate. Uh, it's in it's this essentially the matrix for people who might not yeah. know what the allegory of the cave is. But yeah, essentially you have, you have your consciousness, but mm. the reality that you see is essentially fake. Well, it's shadows, right? It's shadows. In the allegory of the cave, yeah, yeah. it's shadows. So it's like there's the realities and there's a light behind them and all we can see is the shadows. Yeah. Um, I don't think that Buddhism, I, I don't know exactly, you know, what Plato was trying to say there. I suspect it's the same thing that the Buddhist teachers are trying to say. But the allegory, I think, can be misconstrued in the sense that there is a world of realities that is separate from the world that we live in right here and right now. And Buddhism would certainly disagree with that that the real world is right here, right now, right in front of us, and it's just, you know, whether we choose to see this through a lens of resentment and unhappiness and dissatisfaction, or through a lens of acceptance, or just complete non-judgment, I mean, that's up to us, but it's the same reality, and we are the ones who are changing it, you know, through the way we perceive it. Um, Buddhism meditation is a way, I think, to try to remove those various colored lenses, I think, and just see reality just the way it is. But it's always there right in front of us. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Yeah, I would like to thank our speaker, and I would like to thank you all for participating here with us tonight. And I would like to invite you next Wednesday, the 22nd, for uh, next installment uh, in our series. Uh, more information will follow. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you.